Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. They were a wild bunch. To be quite honest with you, Ephesus was known for its debauchery. It was known for very loose living. And so now here we come to chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Remember, he's talking to Christians here. He's talking to those who have become followers of Christ. And he's reminding them of where they were. <laughs> as in, not, not as in they're still in Ephesus, but where they used to be spiritually. Right? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And here's where it gets really good. But God. Aren't you thankful for that? Those two words. But God. God's not done. God intervenes. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with Him. Who's the Him? Jesus. This is a direct reference to the resurrection. We are raised to, up together with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through being a good Christian. Is that what it says? By going to church and being baptized. Is that what it says? Saved by faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, walk in those good works. All right, let's take a moment and pray and ask that God would give us a clear and accurate understanding of His Word. Good Father, thank you for this time that we can open up your word. Thank you for the privilege of holding a copy of your word in our own language in our laps. Thank you that you actually want us to hear from you. You want to speak to us. You want us to know you. You're not unknowable. You're not so far off, so distant. So, trans so above us, beyond us, that we can't know you. You stoop to make yourself known, entering into your own creation through Jesus Christ, moving and directing men to pen your word to us as you told them and, and, and guided them in exactly what to say. Thank you for allowing us to have your word in our laps this morning, to be able to take it home, to study it, to verify what is declared here, to, to research, to do our homework, to make sure that your spokesman got it right. Lord, I'm a human. I can get it wrong. And so thank you for the privilege that we can study for ourselves and to make inquiry into your word and to verify for our own selves through thy spirit of what you have declared to us. And so, Father, as we talk about the relevance of the resurrection today. I pray that it would impact and move our hearts toward praise and holy living, that we would walk in the good works that you have foreordained, that you have prepared beforehand for us to walk in. Lord, this text just shouts, it screams 
of your goodness. It screams of your purpose, of your patience, of a plan that you have for each one of us. That you desire us to walk in that good plan that you have set in motion, even for our lives individually. And so thank you that in spite of some of the choices that we have made in our past, some of the baggage that we perhaps still carry, some of the scars that we bear, we want to say thank you that Jesus' death on the cross has atoned for all of those wrongs done. And that you give us hope, that you desire to remove the baggage that we're trying to carry, a load that we are not designed to handle, a load that only Christ can carry, can deal with, to put to rest once and for all. And thank you that you have designed for us this beautiful liberty, this rest, this relief, the burden lifted through Christ. And so, Father, we give ourselves to you in these moments. Would you be our teacher? Would you lead us into truth? We pray for the ministry downstairs to the children. I pray that your word would go forth with your power and your blessing both upstairs and down. Lord, it's our desire that you would raise up the next generation. Lord, how important it is for our young people to learn the truths of thy word so that they can know you at an early stage in life, that they could make right choices and avoid some of the baggage, some of the scars that we have. And so I pray for understanding, for the accurate presentation of thy word, that it would go forth again with your power, your blessing. Would your spirit move among us? We pray for our sister churches here and abroad, that you would bless each ministry, those that share your word. May you bless the utterance of thy word. Would you protect and shield the hearer of your word from the speaker? Uh, Lord, Protect us from the human element. Protect this congregation from me. Lord, they've not gathered here from me. They've gathered to hear from you. And so, Father, would you speak in spite of me this day? We give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you think of a defining moment, perhaps in your life, maybe even uh, in the life of uh, our nation, that has, in that single moment, changed us dramatically? 9-11 is exactly what came to my mind. Um, Pearl Harbor, another one, but for us in our lifetime, 9-11. In moments, our lives changed. For those of you who are uh, under 23, <laughs> you don't remember those days, but the rest of us remember it very well. Probably most of us can pinpoint where we were at on that day. When you first heard, there was some of that confusion and then if you went to a TV or uh, online to kind of see what was going on, as things unfolded throughout the day, there's a stark memory. And boy, have things changed since. As Mrs. G tried to travel or, or did travel over the last couple of weeks, going through an airport, the security was upped significantly. Getting on a big boat, security, right? Uh, all kinds of different uh, even government organizations that have been implemented laws and policies as far as trying to keep us safe. Homeland Security was formed post 9-11. Uh, the Patriot Act, all these things that whether we agree with all of it or not, whether it's abused or not, I mean, this is, this is the world we live in. As we consider something that affected our nation and even the world, uh, even so it's not in necessarily in one instant, but COVID has changed the world that we live in significantly. Uh, again, not in one day per se, but in a matter of time, my have things changed. Uh, we live in a different world than we lived in even five years ago. And we fear what might take place uh, even in the years to come as the government is seeking to um, monitor and even control and some of these things. As we see Scripture prepping for what we know God has told us is going to take place with uh, the Antichrist, as Satan is seeking to work his plan. There's, there's a movement towards a, a single world government, a time where you cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Um, I'm not saying that we're there yet, of course, but we do see how things are setting, the stage is being set. 
uh, very clearly. And so things that you and I thought we would never see in our lifetime, we can actually see that, boy, it could happen within our lifetime very easily. So all kinds of things that we can think about. Maybe there's a, an instant in your life where life changed. Maybe it's something bad that happened to you that there's the continuing effects. My mom just recently, I shared this with you uh, maybe some weeks, months ago. My mom recently was talking to me of how she feels like she's stuck as a 12-year-old girl. Her mom was killed in a car accident when she was 12. And she said, I feel like I am stuck emotionally as a 12-year-old. I fear things that most adults don't fear. Uh, she's very concerned just relationships-wise of losing people, and, and, and that's understandable. Those, one, those singular moments can have such a lasting impact on our lives, be it good, be it bad. And the reality is here, the death of Christ was an impactful moment on His disciples. But the story isn't over. And as we come to the third day, the first day of the week, Sunday as we would know it, as the disciples, specifically Mary Magdalene and other ladies, went to the tomb and it's, it's empty, uh, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and there's this wow moment as she recognizes his voice. Remember, he, Jesus begins to talk and she thinks it's the gardener. Where have you taken the body? Tell me and I'll remove him. And I'm, I'm trying to think. Here's probably this, this little lady saying, just tell me where he's at and how are you going to move him? Throw him over your shoulder? Uh, okay, maybe there's a couple ladies there. That'd be pretty hard work. And you have to realize the tomb, in most tombs, you have to bend down in to enter. And so, obviously, he's out of the tomb, but where did you put him? Is there some other tomb? Is there some other place? And so, she's probably not thought through all these things, but thinking that the one speaking to her is the gardener, she's saying, where is he? I'll take him off your hands. And then Jesus, with a single word, calling out her name, Mary. She recognizes that voice. And turning and with such joy, I'm, I can imagine some confusion. Am I, can I believe my own eyes? Can I believe my own ears? Wow! A life-changing moment to be sure. And as Jesus appeared later on in the day to his disciples, uh, on a couple of occasions, several occasions, appearing to the disciples, it's a life-changing moment. And the reality is the effects of that day impacted their whole lives. They went from scared men being holed up, doors locked, afraid of the Jews, afraid of all these things, to being men who, after they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, post the resurrection, they're going out and they're preaching to everybody and they don't care if they die. What happened? The resurrection happened. Jesus happened. Victory happened. God gave a greater understanding. Jesus had told them exactly what's going to take place, but they didn't get it. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, oh, now I get it. And I don't, I, I can imagine Jesus saying, yeah, finally, I told you plainly three times, but they didn't get it. It was so obvious, but they didn't get it. We've all been there sometimes. I've shared with you the story when I was in first grade. Our teacher would put our spelling words on the, we would have to write our spelling words and there were sentences that we would have to write out on the, on the board. And it wasn't until very shortly at the end of the week, we, I'd come to the spelling test and be like, man, I've seen these words before and I'm a terrible speller. And I'd be like, man, I, I, I've heard this, I've seen this word before, I don't know how to spell it and I always did really badly. Towards the end of the year, I'm like, oh, these are our spelling test words. And I'm sure she, she told us that time and every week. She probably told us that many times. And I don't know why I'm such a slow learner, but towards the end of the year, I'm like, oh, I better study these words. <laughs> All right. Well, I have no excuse. That's not my teacher's fault. That's my slow brain matter here. Sometimes we don't get the obvious. We have the whole book. Why are we so slow to learn and understand? Why is our faith so weak? Why are we still afraid? Why do we still struggle? Why are we still selfish and proud and lustful and angry and all these things? 
We, we know. We know the truth. We're slow learners, aren't we? Let's take a look then at this text as God is trying, I believe, to, and I, when I say try, I don't mean to suggest that he can't accomplish exactly what, it's not like God takes a swing and a miss, right? He doesn't fail. God does desire to reveal a certain truth to us, the relevance of the resurrection, the power of it. As we do so, as I was preparing, there was a few directions that I was kind of thinking about highlighting, a few directions going. There are so many words here that have a time factor related to it. It's really interesting. Just Let me read just a couple of verses. And you were dead. So, yeah, there's this past tense, but there's... I'm going to pass that one by. In the trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked. In other words, previously. There's a time word. Once walked. Following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now, there's a time word, at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you all once lived, formerly, there's another time word, lived, in the passion of your flesh, carrying out the desire of the body and the mind, but and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great uh, love with which He loved us, even when, there's a time word, when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Him, and He raised us up. And, and we come to verse uh, 7, so that in the coming ages, that's as time-oriented as you can get. He's telling us when. So that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Look at the last verse that we are studying, verse 10, and we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work, works, which God, here's a time word, prepared beforehand. It's one word in the Greek, but there's a prefix that puts a time factor. He prepared, here's the time factor, beforehand. There's all kinds of time-related terms in this text. And so we're going to look at some of the time factors here. But more than that, and if you want to take notes, we're going to look at the, the, the resurrection should cause us to stop and consider two aspects, many aspects, but I'm going to lump them into two. The first one is Christ's resurrection should cause us to consider ourselves. But let me be, give you a word of caution, a word of caution here. When you read the Bible in light of yourself, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. The reality is the Bible is not us-oriented, it's God-oriented. We are created for God's glory. God does not exist for our good, our glory, all right? If you read the Bible as if God exists to take away my problems, to make me happy, to provide for me and all these things, you're, you're orienting your perspective around yourself. The universe revolves around me. And you're going to be frustrated when you figure out it doesn't. <laughs> right? When God doesn't provide everything that you want, when He does allow you to go through struggles, there are real tears as a result of real pain and suffering and loss in these things. So yes, we should consider ourselves, but warning, the world doesn't revolve around us. The Bible is not revolving around us. It revolves around God. And so here's where we're going to end. We should, Christ's resurrection should cause us to consider God and our relationship to God. So that's where we're going here this morning. Before I begin, let me just read a few verses. There are, this is not the only place in Scripture where it talks about us being raised with Christ. So in verse 6, there's this whole fascinating thing that we are raised with Him, seated in the heavenlies. Well, when I got saved, I didn't go to heaven. I'm not there now. We're not seated in the heavenlies physically. What's going on with that? Uh, but there is this close association elsewhere in Scripture. I'm going to read a few verses that, that link Christ's resurrection to our resurrection spiritually. When we ask Christ to be our Savior, something happened internally uh, and I'll read these verses. So in Romans 6, it's probably one of the clearest, clearest texts. It says this, Romans 6, 4 and 5. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. If we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, 
certainly we shall also be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, it, it, this is not to say that a, a physical baptism where you are made wet, <laughs> dunked in water, that's not what he's talking about necessarily in, uh, there's a spiritual aspect is what he's driving at. Getting wet does not remove you from sin, does not remove the sin from you. This is something that only Jesus can do. And so he's talking about, but this baptism is a picture of Christ's death. He was buried, he rose again. And he, Paul here, through the Holy Spirit, is wanting us to, to, to put some pieces of the puzzle together. When we asked Jesus to be our Savior, our old sinful self was put to death with Christ. And we were raised to walk and live a new way than what we used to live. To walk in newness of life. In fact, that's really what we're talking about here in the first three verses of Ephesians 2. I'm going to come back to that. Let's continue on in Romans 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells with you, within you. So there's going to be spiritual life. And even though we may die physically, why, well, you may come to my funeral one day, the reality is that there is life beyond the grave. That because of Jesus, even though we die physically, we will live spiritually. And there's coming a day where God will reunite the physical body. Here's the term is mortal, that which dies. He will reunite your mortal body with your spirit. And as Jesus came back from the dead and he really did have a physical body, and the disciples were amazed. Give me a piece of fish. And he ate fish before their eyes to show them that he wasn't a spirit. He had a physical body. But it was a glorified body. No more to die. And so there's this connection that there's this relevance to the resurrection that Jesus is wanting us to grasp onto that there is a spiritual work that was accomplished when Jesus rose from the dead that gave him the ability to give us that same spiritual life of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, whereby even though we were to die physically, we are going one day, we are going to die, uh, sorry, we are going to live spiritually for eternity. In fact, the moment you take your last breath on earth, the, body sa the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Our body dies, but we don't die. If you're a Christian... We go straight up to heaven. And there's coming a day when God will bring that body to be reunited with your soul. And our body will not be this, this body that we have that's deteriorating, getting old and arthritis and having <laughs> diseases and all these things. We're going to have a glorified body without all those struggles. So some neat stuff. Uh, I like Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ indicating that Jesus is going to come and bring us to, to heaven with him. Colossians 2, 12 and 13, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you are dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our, our trespasses. And, and there's still others. Colossians 3, 1, if then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So Ephesians here, this isn't the only time that God is bringing to our attention that Christ's resurrection has direct implication and relevance to you and me. Not just in the future, but now. All right? So Christ's resurrection should cause us to consider ourselves. Look Let's look at the text here. We should consider our past, and that's exactly what takes place in the first three verses. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. The word dead here is talking about spiritual death. So yeah, you're alive physically, but spiritually as it relates to your relationship with God, you weren't alive. You were dead. We're born dead in our sins it's, uh, is the, the idea here. You were dead in the trespasses and sins. The word trespass is a more intensive word than sins. All of us sin. Sometimes it's unintentional. The word trespass carries the idea of an intentional sin. You know the law, but you break it anyway. That's a trespass. If you're going and you don't know you break the law, you're, you are traveling along and you're not familiar with the area, 
and the officer pulls you over and you're like, I'm sorry, I didn't see the speed limit. I didn't know. Okay, he could choose to be kind and be gracious to you or, or say, well, you're still obligated to pay attention and you didn't. And so here's the consequences for not paying attention. So it could go either way. But one is a sin. I didn't know, but I did violate the law. I'm still guilty. The other one is a trespass. I knew and I gambled. I did it anyway. Trespass. Okay? You are dead in your intentional and even your unintentional sins. You had no relationship with God. This is a pretty bleak reality of where we were. And he's going he's gonna to just start heaping onto this. He wants you to feel the weight of where you were. Again, he's talking to Christians. If you've never asked Christ to be your Savior, if you don't even really know what I'm talking about, this is going to be some bad news before I give you the good news. Okay, there's good news coming. But feel the weight. If you've never asked Christ to be your Savior, this is where you're at. You are dead in your sins. And now he's going to bring another layer, another layer, another aspect, an angle to help you consider just what a desperate state you're in. So verse 2, it says, In which you once walked. So this is the, the idea of walking is not just literally physically walking. It's carrying the idea of your lifestyle. This is how you lived. This is your lifestyle. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you, you lived. Listen now, following the course of this world. You're going along with society. This is just how people live these days. And, oh well. How much has our society changed in the last 70 years? Things that were unthinkable in our grandparents' lives are now done unashamedly. Right? My have things changed. This is the idea. You're following the course of the world. Not God. Just how things are. Society changes. But he's going to add another layer. Following the prince. The word prince there uh, carries the idea of a ruler. Following the ruler of the power of the air. Okay, so now there's this dark side ruler. This ruler of the power of the air. I think he's talking about this world. The spiritual realm, air. You can't see it, can't touch it. I think he's talking about the spiritual realm, but in this world. But you're following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now, this can be a little bit confusing, and I don't mean to get into too much grammar here on you, but I think what's going on here is that the spirit is not the same as the prince. It'd be easy for us to say the prince or the ruler of the power of the air, that's Satan, this demonic spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. I don't think that's what's going on here. Grammatically, that can't take place with the Greek structure here. Actually, I think what's going on is that he's the ruler, this ruler, you're following the ruler of the power of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And the spirit here is not a demon, a fallen spirit, I think it's talking about, again, just this philosophy, the spirit of the age, uh, how people think, this philosophy. So they're, they're, they are under the, the ruler, the, the, the authority, the rule of this power of the air, Satan, the ruler of how the world is thinking, the philosophy of the world that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He calls them the sons of that's not limited to males. That's the children of disobedience. Disobedience to whom? To God, to God's Word, right? He's going to add some more. Among whom, now, now lest, lest you get on your high horse and say, that's not me. What's it say? Among whom we all once lived. There's no room for pride. There's no room for haughtiness or self-righteousness. We've all been there. In the same breath, dear friend that may be struggling, there's no reason that you need to bow your head in shame in this way. We've all been there. We've all had scars and baggage. There's all, we've all had regrets, but there's hope for you. So he says, verse 3, Among whom we all once lived, notice, in the passions of our flesh, Doing whatever feels good. Go to the party, hang out, 
ingest whatever, sleep with whomever. That's exactly what he's talking about. You live according to the passion of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We're no better than animals. You just do what comes naturally. What feels good, you just do it. And you just feed the body. Whatever comes to mind, you indulge. You think about whatever you want. And you're following the very philosophy of Satan. That's what this text is teaching. We've all been there. And here's where it gets the most bleak. And we're by nature children of, what's the next word? Wrath. Whose wrath? By nature. What's that mean? It's who we are. We all have a sinful nature. We're born with a sinful nature. We're born dead in our sins. Enemies of God. Children of wrath, it says here, like the rest of mankind. I use this illustration often, forgive me if it's annoying to you, but you don't have to teach a one- or a two-year-old how to be selfish, do you? You don't have to teach them how to fight, how to yell, how to pitch a temper tantrum when they don't get what they want. <laughs> uh, you put one ball between two little kids, and you see that even the youngest of little kids have a sinful nature. It's just in them. They're rebellious. You say no, and they look at you and do it anyway. Oh, all right? Sinful nature. By nature, they do these things. You don't even have to teach them that. They just do it. And it says here that we were all, by nature, children of wrath, of God's wrath, of judgment. I think it would be helpful for us to turn to John chapter 3. You're all nervous because I have a whole lot of outline left, and I'm going to try to get through that in a... Eh? John 3, the most famous verse in the Bible is probably verse 16, isn't it? John 3, 16. In fact, let's quote it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What's the next verse say? You have that one memorized? Let's continue on. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So when we're talking about the wrath of God, there are some who misunderstand that God is this mean old ogre that is looking down from heaven at these little ants, and as soon as they do something wrong, he's so excited to squash them like an ant, and like, ha, gotcha, you little pest. But that's not God. Why did God send Jesus into the world? Verse 17. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it. He's not eager to, to condemn anybody. Rather, it says in order that the world might be rescued, saved through this one Jesus. Let's keep going. Whoever believes in Him, the Him there is Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment Here's, here's the boiling down of the analysis. The light has come into the world, that's Jesus, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, Jesus, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Just a practical question. Why are bars usually really dark? Why are nightclubs? Why are some of those other places that Christians ought not to go? Why are they dark? The, the reality is that there's something in us that in those situations we don't want bright. We want to just kind of blend in. We want to do our thing. We want to have what we want to feed the flesh. 
without people knowing too much. You do it in private. You do it with those friends that you know you're on the same page and they're not going to look down their nose at you and be all judgmental and all these attitudes, right? This is, this is just how we work. Why does a child go and if he swipes something, he goes and he opens it up in secret? Because he knows if he does it in front of mom, there's going to be big trouble, <laughs> right? They go hide and that's just in us. And this is the whole idea here of darkness. Man loves darkness. Go hide as we do our things. Why, do, why, why does most crime take place at night? Well, these days, they're so bold they do it anytime. Carjackings in the middle of the day and all these other things. But there was a time where, and still, most crime takes place at night so that people don't see as much. Easier to hide, easier to flee, easier to not get caught. Let's turn to the last verse in this. Whoever, verse 36 of John 3 says this, whoever believes in the Son has what? Eternal life, everlasting life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, notice, but the wrath of God remains. You could say abides on Him. Isn't that a scary verse? What's the key here? Believing in Jesus. Now let me give you a word of caution. Just because you believe the right stuff about Jesus does not mean that you're, you're going to heaven. That sounds really contradictory. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yes, but it's more than just a mental agreement with a set of truths. Right? James chapter 2 verse 19 says, the demons also believe and tremble. Are demons going to be in heaven? Of course not. Thou believest in one God, thou doest well, whoop de doo So you have your right theology. You believe in one God. There's not multiple gods, there's only one. Good for you. Even the demons get that one right. They're not going to heaven. That's the whole point. Just because you believe the right stuff does not mean you have a genuine salvation, change of heart. And so when it says this whole obey <laughs> Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Well, just a second. I thought we're supposed to believe. It's by faith. In fact, that's what uh, Ephesians 2 here is saying. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's not of your own creation, your own design, your own manipulation, your own provision. None of that. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. So, but in John it says, if you don't obey then the wrath of God remains on you. The whole obey here, I think, I think Romans is helpful in our understanding of it. There's this aspect of obeying to believe. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, uh, I believe it is. It's in the middle of a paragraph to find the beginning of the verse. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. Ha <laughs> ha. Obedience here is linked to faith. There is an act that God desires of us to do in order to receive salvation. It's not an act by means of, uh, it's not a work. It's, it's merely accepting. To believe unto, to obey unto belief, to obey unto faith. That same term is utilized, that same phrase is used again in Romans chapter 16, 26. The obedience of faith. It's not obedience of works. It's not obedience of doing good things and, and, and trying to merit God's favor. It's the obedience whereby we bend our thinking, our will, our understanding to acknowledge that we need Jesus as the gift and Him alone, and there's no salvation apart from Him, period. Okay, are you with me? Do you track with that? So, Christ's resurrection should cause us to consider our past. We were all children of wrath. Going down the wrong road in rebellion towards God. I'm going to pause here and we're going to go to the second point, the second main point. I'm going to skip B and go on down to the next uh, B and C. And I'm going to go to, if you're like taking notes, the second part of the message. Christ's resurrection should cause us to consider God. We've considered where we were. We're going to come back and figure out where we are, where we will be. But before we can do that, we have to consider God. Let's look at verse 4. 
So I'm in, I'm in Ephesians chapter 2 again. Let's begin, or look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, here's the good stuff. Jesus' resurrection should cause us to consider how good God is. And here's what the text says. God is not eager to squash us like ants. God is rich. It is abundant and not just, not just rich enough to cover the bill and three cents extra for a tip. <laughs> He's so rich and wealthy and generous. That's the idea of rich. This abundance in overflowing. He's rich in what? Mercy. Aren't you glad God doesn't give us what we deserve? We do deserve to be squashed like ants. We deserve to be cast into hell because of our rebellion against God, doing our own thing, following Satan instead of Him. We deserve to be crispy critters. But God, who is rich in mercy, sent Jesus to rescue us. Why? Because He loves us in spite of our selfish beings. As they say down south, Tammy, bless their pointy little heads, <laughs> right? Down south, they look at somebody who's being dumb and they say, well, bless their pointy little head, you know? All right, maybe they'll grow out of this. Maybe they'll smarten up. Bless their pointy little head. It's this, oh, well, but I love them anyways. God loves us anyways. God loves us still. But His love does not, His love cannot allow us to remain as we are and enter into heaven. Because God is a righteous judge, because we have violated God's law, the righteous judge, God, has to say, you're guilty. You've broken my law. You've committed treason. You're worthy of death. And a righteous judge must condemn sin. But God, who is rich in mercy, has carried out justice that is deserved to us through Christ. God punished Jesus in our stead because of His rich, surpassing, generous mercy. So that if we receive the gift of Jesus, that's what it's saying there in verses 8 and 9, for by grace we're saved through faith. This is none of your own doing. This is all only what Jesus did, right? It's not by going to church. It's not by being baptized. It's not by coming and celebrating the resurrection. These are all fine things, but that doesn't get you to heaven. It's accepting Jesus as the gift. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. You cannot bribe your way into heaven. You can't be just good enough where God puts your works in a scale, and if your, your good tips the scale and you, it outweighs your bad, he's like, all right, wink, wink, come on in, kid. That's not how it works. God as a righteous judge cannot ignore your bad, your, your guilt. But he's provided a means for justice to be executed on Christ so that if we accept the gift of Christ, Christ takes our guilt upon himself and he gives us his righteousness so that through his death and resurrection, he can then give us his life. So we're qualified to be in heaven with him. Such beauty. A masterpiece of God. God is rich in His mercy. Verse 4 again, it continues on. Because of the great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were intentionally thumbing our nose at God. Doesn't that irk you when, when, when you were raising your children and you said something and they just ignored you? How much more so... Yeah, he's not supposed to lie in church. How much more so... <laughs> not anywhere ever, but anyway... How much more so when they look you in the eyes and they say, no, ho, 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 blood boils instantly, right? I learned very early on, you just don't say no to parents, my parents. I could get a warning or two before I got the, the, something applied to my backside to help me learn, okay? If I said no, there were no further warnings. We went straight to discipline, <laughs> discipleship. That's really what it was. It was discipleship. You cannot do that. Why? Because they were trying to teach me that obedience is necessary. If I don't obey them, I'm never going to obey God. And by obeying them, I am obeying God. God has placed them 
me and their lives, them over me, to, sh to teach and show me himself. And so there's this beautiful picture even within the family unit. God loved us even when we were looking at him defiantly and saying, no, I'm doing my own thing. Leave me alone. Wow. We maybe never thought that through and did that, but our sin is defiance against God. It's defiance against God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. The moment you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, God gives you His life, His spiritual life. The Spirit comes, and He's called the Spirit of life. And there's this regeneration the giving of life again, spiritual life. This is what Jesus was talking about with Nicodemus in John 3. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And, and Nicodemus is like, how can I enter the second time into my mother's womb? Be born twice, huh? What? No, 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 you're misunderstanding. We've all been born physically, but the reality is we have to be born spiritually, born again of the Spirit, spiritual life. And Jesus said, don't marvel that I... I say you must be born again. You have to be born of the Spirit so that you can become a citizen of, a child of God, a citizen of heaven. All because of God's great love. And so he says again, verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. By grace. By, by God giving you what you didn't deserve. What did we deserve? Punishment forever in hell. But God is gracious. Part of that word grace means favor. But God shows his favor on you when you didn't deserve it. Unmerited favor is what grace is sometimes defined as. By grace you've been saved. Not, not by your performance, but through Jesus' performance. Through Jesus' provision. You're saved by grace. Through faith, by believing. But not just head knowledge, by making the choice to receive the gift of Jesus as your Savior. Verse 8, so we're, we're ticking through our, our outline now. God gives us spiritual life. We're saved by grace. He's raised us up with Christ. He has seated us in the heavenly places. This is a hard one, verse 6. I think what's going on here is that we are positionally in Christ uh, and we have all the benefits and blessings available to us now. We have God's ear. We are welcomed into God's presence. In Hebrews, we are encouraged to come boldly to the throne of grace. There could be this aspect of even, it says we are seated with Christ, seated in the heavenlies. Uh, in heaven, only, only, only God sits. <laughs> the ruler sits. Jesus, when he went to heaven, he's seated at the Father's right hand and ever lives to intercede on our behalf. I think there's this idea of he's welcoming us, us to his very presence in granting us all of the authority, all of the rights of being his children. Is that not exactly what John 1 says? To them uh, who receive him, to them gave he the power, the authority to become the sons of God, even those who believe on his name, right? So we have all of the spiritual benefits already ours, even though we're still struggling in our sins now. There's God's favor. There's God's blessing. There's God's power. Satan is no longer in authority over you. You can say no to Satan. <laughs> you can walk in victory. Wow, this is a big deal. He will show us immeasurable riches, verse 7. Um, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So there's this grace and kindness. Again, grace, and it doesn't just stop there. And this overflowing of kindness that he has waiting for us. And God has prepared good works for us who walk in Him, verse 10. God has prepared something. God has prepared good works for you to participate in. You are going to reach people that I can't reach. You're going to do things that no one else can do. God has a purpose and a plan for each one of us. And that means that God has prepared divine appointments. You meeting with somebody else to look like Christ before them, to share Christ with them. Maybe it's in your home. Divine appointment of being a model parent, appointing your children to Christ, of helping them learn, even sometimes the hard way, by discipleship. You can't do that. 
You need to learn to obey me. In so doing, you're learning to obey God. Right? All these different things. God has good works that he has prepared for you. Are you willing to join in that? Now we can go back and consider ourselves. We should consider, we've already looked at our past, now our present. We're alive with Christ. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And we have good works to do. We have a purpose in life. We're not just existing. We're not just, life's not meaningless. Just living from one weekend to the next. <laughs> putting in our time at work. Hating every second of it. All right, now it's Friday. Woohoo! There's more to life than weekends. A vacation. Retirement. God has a purpose for our plan, to, to glorify Him by making Him known to other people as well. Our future, I, I, I don't, we're limited in what we can say. The scripture doesn't go into great detail other than it's going to be amazing. So we know this, we can anticipate immeasurable kindness from God. So, verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable. You can't even measure it. There is no ruler. There is no laser going the distance. There is no measurement. It's not possible. You cannot measure the, the kindness, the riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. Our future is going to be unbelievable. And I can't, I, I'm sorry I can't go into more detail. We know a little, little bit. It's going to be awesome because God's there. Because God is going to be working His beautiful plan still there. I think this too. We anticipate unimaginable contentment with God. You know the first three verses as we were dead in our trespasses, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body. Do you know what? Before Christ, all we were ever doing is trying to find satisfaction somewhere. Trying to find happiness, joy that lasted more than a party, or joy that came when you buried yourself, your sorrows in a bottle or another substance, and then you wake up, with a headache and a hangover, and things are even worse. Fractured relationships, all these different things. Our soul desires this satisfaction, peace, belonging, acceptance, hope, joy that can only be found in God. We are going to experience God in His fullness, and it's going to be immeasurable just how kind God is, but it's going to be unimaginable how content we will, we will be, not because of all the perks of heaven, but because of the God of heaven with us. So how does the resurrection affect you? As a Christian, this should say, all right, Maybe I need to get cracking in trying to live out those good works God has prepared for me. Are you even thinking along those lines every day? Most of us get up and say, all right, I got to go do this. I got to go to work. I got to do this. Make the kids lunch. Make sure they're educated. All these different things. Pay the bills. Make supper. Do dishes. Oh, more laundry. And it's just task, 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 task. Right? When our perspective changes to... God has called me and given me the privilege of being a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, an employer. When my perspective gets a little bit bigger in that God wants me to represent Him well to my husband or wife, my son or daughter, my coworker, my family member, my this, that, or the other thing, and instead of viewing tasks to be done, we view it as, Lord, I do this unto you that they might see you through me as I give of myself, my time, my energy, my expertise in serving them. I, I've been overwhelmed in the last months as I try to think this way, even within my own marriage, as we sit down at the table for a meal. I often give thanks to God saying, this is a taste of heaven on earth. There is coming a day when we are going to sit at Jesus' table and partake in a meal that he has prepared for us. 
out of His generous love and kindness. And God has given us a glimpse of what's coming even through these earthly, earthly relationships. That means real work. <laughs> but there's this selfless love of preparing food after a long days of work and all these other things, other things that she could be doing. And she sets it down and with eager anticipation, she looks at me to see if I like it. Wow! Man, is that humbling. That's humbling. My wife works hard to make me happy, to please me, to make sure I'm healthy, strong. It's a taste of heaven on earth. Making a meal can be a drudgery if you have the wrong perspective. Doing laundry, changing a bed, making it all over again, more towels to wash, more dishes to dry, wash, dry, put away, you can have a bad attitude, oh, drudgery, 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 why, 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 life is always the same. Nope, there's a purpose. As we model Christ to the, those that God has blessed us with in relationship. And that includes those at work too, doesn't it? How are you doing? How's the resurrection affecting you? Has it affected your attitude, your perception of tasks? More than that, your percep perception of people? More than that your perception of the good God we serve. There's where we want to end. As we get so captivated with God, that should change everything else. Our, all our other perspectives change our, our desire to say, I'm willing to serve. I do it unto you, O Lord. Let's pray. Uh, Father, you are so wise, and we just marvel at your design in sending Jesus to die on the cross for us and the impact that carries on because of the resurrection, because of Jesus' victory over Satan, because he was selfless. Father, would you change our perspective that we would run to the good works that you've prepared beforehand for us to, to walk in, that we would be eager to do it, not out of complaint, not out of obligation and drudgery. Lord, help us not to get weary in well-doing. May we view the menial tasks of life as eternal opportunities to reflect you, to point others, to bring others along the way to you. Lord, may you be our destination. We want to be satisfied with you. So help us to quit chasing those other desires and pursuits that we already know don't satisfy. Oh, Scripture tells us that sin is fun for a season, but there's always a price tag. There's always a cost. It always hurts in the long run. Father, may we find our delight, our satisfaction, our peace, our joy in thee. 